So welcome to April's First Friday with the Thought Leader. Glad you are all here. I'm Janice Kaye, and I am one of the co-founders of Currentus, and I am thrilled you are all here. Alexander Kaye is the other co-founder, and he will be bringing us through a coherence moment. Thank you, Janice. Sure. Good to see everyone. So let's just take a moment just to get centered and present. So just find a relaxing spot where you're sitting or standing or wherever you are from. Let's take a moment to all take a deep breath and another deep breath. And then just find a nice rhythmic breathing pattern that suits you. Longer, slower breaths. At your own, at your own rhythm, whatever rhythm works for you. Just a little longer and a little slower. Now focus your attention to the area in and around your heart. Imagine an open space. Now generate a genuine feeling of gratitude, appreciation, or love for someone, someplace, something in your life. Genuinely feel it and breathe that feeling in and out through your heart. Okay, come back into the room, take a deep breath. And with that, thank you, Janice. Thank you, Alexander. So this is a private event for the members of the Corinthus Global Community. So people with a passion for transforming teams. That basically means if you've been to any of these programs, not just Corinthus programs, but any of these programs, you are a welcome member into this community. And now I'm very excited to bring on our thought leader. So Ms. Emily Goulds is a former government attorney turned mediator turned leadership development coach and consultant. Her interest in trauma and trauma-informed practice began in the late 80s while running a federally funded unit prosecuting staff on patient sexual abuse in psychiatric facilities. Many years later, when working in post-genocide Rwanda with mediators beyond dual borders, her interest in collective trauma renewed. And through that experience, she was able to begin to heal the intergenerational trauma in herself as the offspring of Eastern European Jews that survived the Holocaust and other traumas. Recently, as a law reform consultant to the country of Rwanda, she authorized the, authored the first trauma-informed justice policy of any country in the world, which centers restorative justice as the primary justice modality. Her company, Next Gen Leadership, is a multiracial, interdisciplinary, and international company that works to support the integration of collective trauma in the workplace. And with that, I bring you Emily Gould. It is really fun to be with so many good friends and teachers, as well as uh, new friends and colleagues. And uh, especially a pleasure to talk about this topic, not only because it's dear to my heart, uh, because I think it's so resonant with the material that Corentis has developed. Um, Janice didn't say in my bio that I'm a student <laughs> of uh, Alexander and Janice and the Corentis team, and I'm um, very grateful for all I've had a chance to learn from them and see a lot of overlap. Um, some of what I'm going to be talking about will be uh, old news to some of you, and for some of you, it might be new. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk briefly for about 15 minutes and then uh, open it up to Q&A, because that's really where the fun is. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but just big picture, before we move on, Janice, I just want to say one more thing. And thank you for doing the slides for me. Um, but I think that there is a growing awareness of the phenomenon of collective trauma. Um, certainly there was, uh, for the, probably the last decade, a more uh, integration into the public zeitgeist about individual trauma. But uh, in some part, thanks to the pandemic, the uh, global understanding of collective trauma is becoming more to the fore. Uh, and I think it's really important that we pay attention to it as we see, as we move into an era of more poly crises, right? With the environment, climate, uh, politics, and the outbreak of war. So this is much more on people's minds. And um, as collective trauma, it shows up for all of us. And as it has an impact on the workplace. So those of us who are concerned about cultivating <laughs> peace in the workplace, um, this is an important topic for all of us that I think are involved in either coaching or consulting leadership development or anything like that. At the same time, I think the work, we really don't as a global community have societal structures for integrating collective trauma. Uh, and as a result, it just keeps building up without really an antidote. So for me, what's really exciting about working with Carentis is, is to think that the workplace could be not just the uh, impact receiver of collective trauma, but could actually become the place for trauma integration. People spend so much time of their lives in, in work. Imagine if the workplace could be transformed into a place where we can actually start to process and integrate and harvest the wisdom that is embedded in the frozen energy of, of collective trauma. So that's, that's really what is the vision uh, for our work together as practitioners that I'm holding that uh, makes me so excited to talk to you about this. <laughs> so uh, with that as our, as our vision for where we're headed as a community of practice, um, let's start with uh, some of uh, the traditional wisdom about what uh, trauma-informed practice means. Uh, so this definition uh, comes from actually the United States government, and it's pretty old, uh, but it, uh, I think it's a good um, uh, a rubric, right, to organize our thinking. And uh, I'm going to basically follow this outline of, uh, in, the, in the talk that I'm going to give. First of all, uh, trauma-informed community or approach needs to understand what trauma is and needs to be able to recognize the symptoms of trauma and needs to know how to respond to it. That is um, how to respond appropriately is particularly important because trauma doesn't respond to <laughs> many of the tricks of the trade that we are so <laughs> pleased to have. And it can be frustrating where everything we know to do uh, isn't really um, moving the dial. And those of us who work in change processes certainly have been familiar with when everything we know to do just doesn't work. And so uh, having an approach that deals with something that is different from what we're used to working with is really important. Avoiding re-traumatization <laughs> is a very important principle, but for reasons that we'll explain, are very hard to do and really require some conscious attention on the part of both leaders and us as practitioners. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing is taking self-responsibility for our own 
trauma healing because if and if this approach means anything we know that the state of our own nervous system is both the best asset that we have really our clients are learning from the state of our own nervous system and so much of the work that Corentis does around paying attention to our own state of being is is right on point there. Peer support uh, for that process is really a hallmark of any trauma-informed organization or, or approach. So what you've experienced today in the first five minutes with Corentis is just a little taste of what we're talking about, but that's the sort of thing that we want to pay attention and we find more and more as a uh, professional skill in service of our own well-being. <laughs> so let's just talk about um, what trauma is. Everyone quoted here is a beloved teacher of mine. Um, Bessel van der Kolk was actually my first expert witness in the 80s <laughs> when I was prosecuting. Um, but the main thing is to understand that trauma is not the event. Trauma is the impact on the nervous system, right? So beautifully, trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. So it's understanding that it's the impact on the nervous system and what gets held and not processed in the body. That trauma is a physiological event. It is not a psychological event. It's not, a, as Resna would say, it's not a character flaw. It's actually a very, very effective tool for survival. A lot of the work that we do in from a trauma-informed approach is to respect the intelligence of that physiological response. It's only through really bowing down to the intelligence of the traumatic response that we have the opportunity to receive its blessing to move forward and, and, and move on and soften that. Now, if we know that uh, trauma is an impact on the nervous system, that helps us to understand what might be happening in the individual. But uh, how does this work in the collective? Well, it turns out that my nervous system <laughs> is connected to your nervous system. And all of our nervous systems here on the call, we our bodies are talking to each other. <laughs> and this is happening completely outside of our awareness. The part of the nervous system that's impacted by trauma, the autonomic part of the nervous system, you could also call it, it's the automatic part of our nervous system. It is the part that is working outside of our conscious uh, you know, attention and awareness. This is, controls our digestion and our breathing and uh, all, our immunity, all sorts of things that Fortunately, we don't have to think about all day. They just happen <laughs> thanks to our autonomic nervous system. Um, but because there is a connection between humanity's nervous system, we could almost talk about a humanity's nervous system. And this is the aspect of the nerve inside each of us. There's a part of my nervous system that is related to my own historical biography, but there's a part of my nervous system that is absolutely connected to what is happening uh, around me. And uh, so we can talk about the collective nervous system. But then the, the huge, I mean, on the one hand, humanity has known for tens of thousands of years the connection between how life flows from one generation to another. But we now know through the science of epigenetics that the traumatic experience, either individual or collective, of our predecessors actually also has a home in our nervous system. Uh, and the state of our nurse nervous system has an impact 
on generations and generations to come. We can th- it's all the same biology, but we can separate it into individual, ancestral, and collective trauma. So these are terms that I think it's just important to understand the different kinds of trauma, even though they work in very similar ways. This is just my own very corny, and please don't take offense at how corny it is. But this is how I explain trauma to myself. And it's based on a couple of years ago, I had surgery. And um, I have a lot of wonderful neighbors who brought a tremendous amount of food to my house while I was lying on the couch. Now, that was an overwhelming amount of food. And what we know about trauma is it is a response to overwhelming life events that we cannot actually, that overwhelms our body's capacity to integrate it. So using the analogy of the food that people claimed to my house, I could not, there was no way I was going to eat that and um, be able to eat it. Uh, And in that way, it's uh, analogous to the situation of overwhelm. Because normally during REM sleep, that is ordinarily where our body-mind takes the experience of the day and in ways we don't really understand through uh, rapid eye movement, we separate what do we need to forget? What do we need to remember? Because there are learning in it. there's learning in it. And that's how life experience gets integrated when we're in a state of homeostasis. But that doesn't happen when we're overwhelmed. Instead, what the body does is what I did. I took the food, I put it in the freezer. Right? So um, in, a, in our own miraculous way, our bodies have a way to uh, freeze that experience until it can be thawed and integrated. Now, of course, my freezer had many layers of you know, Thanksgiving dinners already in it. And we're in the same boat as a society. We have all these frozen layers of life experience, all this atrocity that has happened over centuries, still living in our, still frozen in our nervous system. And that then you get the process of trauma integration becomes complicated by all the different layers underneath, biographical, ancestral, collective. With apologies for the oversimplification, let's move on. <laughs> um, so uh, I owe this concept to Resmo Manicum. The two main symptoms of trauma that we see is on the one hand, speeding up, and this can show up as a sense of urgency, right? Got to do it now. And on the other hand, stuckness, where things just don't move, right? Um And, uh, of course, this shows up differently in individuals and organizations, um, but we want to keep an eye on these two different manifestations of trauma. Of course, the symptoms of trauma are not the trauma itself. So if we're only dealing with the symptoms and not dealing with the underlying cause, we're not going to be very effective. Let's move on and look at... um, this work, we, it, it is helpful to know a little bit about the science of neuro, neurophysiology because the real uh, understanding of how we should work as practitioners is embedded in the science. And in this way, my work is in, entirely, <laughs> this image of the traffic light comes from Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. Um, He's a scientist who has really uh, made a major uptick in our understanding of the collective nervous system, how we are constantly outside of our awareness, searching our environment for cues of safety. And the big uh, aha that we get from uh, Portis's work is that the opposite of safety is not, is um, 
uh, the opposite of threat is not the absence of threat. It's actually the presence of connection. So that we are looking for either threat or welcome all the time. So as we cultivate ourselves as practitioners, our main question is to what extent are we signaling welcome, knowing that the entire capacity to learn, to be creative, innovative, collaborative, that's all based on what he calls the social engagement system, which was one path of the vagus nerve as it winds through our body. It's called polyvagal because it's based on the vagus nerve in our body. And I promise I'm not going to go into the science here, but just understand that our homeostasis, the place in our nervous system where we do our best work, is all related to the social engagement system in our body, that uh, activation of the fight or flight uh, instinct is based on fear and threat. And that's what produces the symptom of urgency, of speeding up, uh, uh, of anxiety, and unfortunately, illness too, because our immune response is related to the social engagement system and um, the lack thereof uh, impacts us physically. If we cannot gain purchase from fight or flight, our body has another capacity, which is simply to shut down. And this is related to the survival instinct. And this is where we see um, people not speaking up, muteness, uh, stuckness, um, depression, low morale, even apathy in the workplace. So uh, I don't want to take too much time with the science, uh, but one of the important things about the social engagement system is that this nerve runs in the upper portion of our bodies it really impacts our capacity to hear how we speak, how we breathe, and, how, and our face. So think of a mother cradling a baby or father, right? The way we talk without thinking about it. We don't think about how we talk to a baby. We just know. But these are the aspects of uh signaling welcome that are built into our bi biology and can become part of our professional competence. So <laughs> there's a lot in this, um, but, but just wanting to draw attention to what Freud really brought into our awareness is the repetition cycle of, of trauma. This is something, of course, we, we saw as we as a society became more aware of the issue of domestic violence or sexual violence, especially domestic violence, we came to we came up with a phrase, hurt people, hurt people. What is that? That is the repetition cycle of, of, of trauma. It's frozen energy that wants to be released, but without the proper circumstances for release, it will just cycle in and, in and around itself. And we can see globally uh, how that may play out, where you could look at many of what is happening in the 21st century as what is the unresolved collective trauma of the 20th century, right? Um, and that being the collective result of, you know, hundreds of years of uh, colonialism and imperialism. What we learned about um, families is true of the human family. So this gives us a certain importance to our work because we under, can understand that this, our capacity, inner capacity to host the emergence of collective trauma and create 
uh, space where it can come up for digestion and integration. This is where we hold uh, the promise to release the wisdom of the ages that is right now sitting frozen in the nervous system of each and every one of us, right? Um, so lastly, I'll, I'll stop just this, a few, how does this impact our, um, our practice? Corantis is all about creating awareness, team awareness, right? And our capacity to do that is uh, enhanced by our own capacity to develop internal awareness and spaciousness, right? The other thing is um, if we understand that productivity and success, professional success or commercial success is dependent on the quality of our relationships with each other and understanding that whether we are conscious of our or not, through our voice, through our face, through our smiles, if there's any one intervention we could introduce that would be successful is to have a smile that comes from the inside out. It doesn't work <laughs> if we're faking it, but it does work if it's genuine. Um, and then to as much as possible wel welcome an emergence uh, of collective trauma. At, be understanding it wants to come up and when it is suppressed in the workplace because we can't handle it we or the clients of ours who are leaders can't handle it that is the very thing that creates the repetition cycle so the capacity to welcome and be with what is present so such that there can be both reflection digestion and integration of that process is really what's important. Um, and of course, understanding that our, our physical bodies are our most precious instrument and the care um, with which we treat ourselves and our precious human lives really matters. Um, so aside from smiling, I would say if there's one practice tip it's just to slow down, to understand that the, uh, we're living in a society that is unconscious of its addiction to speed. And uh, the most successful intervention sometimes is simply to slow down the process. So uh, that's really what I want to say. I have some... <laughs> So in addition to the books that I referenced, these are some of the uh, texts and teachers to whom I, I bow down. And uh, let's open it up for questions because I really want to see how this lands for all of you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Let's open it up for questions. Emily, I wish I could just hug you. I'm so happy to see you again. I want to ask you a thousand things, but I'm only going to ask one. Could you please repeat what you said about antidote is not the absence of trauma, but... Not the absence of threat, but is actually connection. Okay. Right. Because in connection, that's how we can process those frozen layers. Is that right? That's the way to process it. Absolutely. And because it's not, trauma is not related to whether we are actually under threat. It's whether we feel that we're under th threat, right? It's the felt sense of that. Often that is happening outside of our conscious awareness, right? And, um, the, the devilish thing about the repetition cycle is that our nervous systems can be shaped to be more oriented to, to sense threat 
if we live, if we grow up in circumstances of chronic threat, our nervous system will be turned on to continuously seek threat and therefore have the felt sense of being under threat, right? So that's the thing that matters. So that's why, you know, as facilitators, we might try to create safe space. Well, (laughs) uh, hello, it's not up to us entirely. It is up to the shaping of the nervous system of everybody in the room or that we are working with. And that can be shaped to experience connection or it can be shaped to experience threat depending upon those three levels, biographical, ancestral, and collective experience. So does that, have I met you where you live, Jennifer? (laughs) Emily, thank you so much. Make me think about clients, family, myself. Thank you. Hillary. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emily. This is um, new material for me in a professional realm. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'd like to hear you speak a little bit more about the, the basic term of integration that you're using. Um, I think I know what you mean, um, you know, sort of integrating into our workplace vocabulary, into our processes, but I'd love to hear you talk about integration and what you mean by that. Well, in, uh, we can speak of it as um, it's both a physiological uh, and cognitive process, right? Um, I would need to speak a little bit more about different wisdom traditions of trauma to explain how it is that wisdom is in or information is embedded in the frozen layers of trauma. Uh, but I'll just say, just as brief example, in the shamanic tradition, uh, trauma is understood to be a, the result of an abuse of power. And when trauma gets integrated, so there's actually wisdom about power that's embedded in the frozen experience of trauma. Trauma integration Mm -hmm. uh, in in pretty much every tradition seems to involve an uptick in either wisdom, learning, or ethics, right? So trauma integration often involves a conscious understanding of personal power and how to use it for good rather than for bad. Um, so uh, in, the, in the workplace, integration of, of a trauma would be information or wisdom that then becomes conscious in the organization. So, I mean, for example, we now see much more uh, sensitivity to the issue of wellness, employee wellness. That, that, that's a learning that is coming to the workplace that it, it is the product of the reflection that people are, uh, our leaders are doing, for example, even on the impact of the pandemic. Right. Uh, And learning about how to connect. What does connection mean when we're not physically together? These are all learnings that are released uh, and become conscious processes rather than unconscious processes. Integration. Does that make sense, Hillary? Thank you. Thank you. All right, last question, Jonathan. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Emily. And I realize there's only so much you can talk about, and maybe this goes too far. But I'm wondering if you might touch on the role of shame and our potential impact as anti-shame agents through connection and acceptance. 
I think adopting this perspective means adopting a process perspective so that we see that shame, like all emotions, is a process that uh, is that it's a process that is. I think the highest level of practice is not to put ourselves against a process that is, but to develop the capacity to be with it as a process, understanding that that is what allows the process to complete itself. That's where the Enzo circle comes into place. Understanding that we're not, this is not about setting us up in, in opposition, but developing the capacity to be with the process as it emerges. For those of you that are familiar with the Carentis process, <laughs> it, built into the OPO is the distinction between verbs and nouns. So we want to be less focused on the nouns, what's, what's being produced, and more centered on the verbs. What is the process that's happening? How can we welcome it, be with it, bring our conscious attention to it, and uh, allow the people experiencing it to, to borrow our awareness to develop their own uh, awareness. And one of the main processes that we need to, one of the huge products of power over systems is internalized self-judgment. We have a collective inner critic and becoming conscious of that as a process together and making it a conscious process of how it works in us, that I believe is our most successful path in shifting our relationship to our inner critic. Because that's where I think the gold is to develop the compassion for that part of ourselves that makes us feel so bad, but it's actually a very intelligent process given reality as it is. And, you know, we're not about, this is about being grounded in reality as it is. We can't change that, we can change our relationship to it. And that's where I think the movement happens. Emily so much so we just want to take a 10 seconds moment of silence normally we clap but it just feels right to just do in a 10 second moment of silence appreciation for Emily being here with us Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, and with that, thank you. And Alexander, you want to do a 30 second quick coherence out? Emily, I think we just nicked the top of the iceberg with you. I know. <laughs> I feel like this could be an eight hour, an eight hour conversation, but I would have everybody just take a deep breath and just reflect upon what did you learn today? Just take a moment to reflect. It's always good to reflect after a, a moment of learning. What, what did you learn today? What insight is coming up for you coming away from these 45 minutes? What's present for you right now? Just hold that 
and maybe write it down as a thought. Great, thank you. Janice, back to you. Great. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy life. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see everyone. <laughs>